My name is John V. Welcome to Chautauqua People. My guest today is Dr. Ellis Coling, Distinguished University Professor Emeritus at North Carolina State University. Ellis, where were you born? Where did you spend your childhood? <laughs> I was born in Waukegan, Illinois, between church, church services that my father was leading. So uh, Waukegan is where is my home, Jack Benny's hometown. I really? Think. Yes. So you're very close to the Wisconsin state line. That's right. And your father was a pastor? That's right. And he came and said, Prayer of, thanks, prayer of thanksgiving after the second service and, <laughs> and a request after the first. Yeah. <laughs> Where did you spend your childhood? Well, we lived in Waukegan for a time, mm -hmm. and then we moved to Indiana, and mm -hmm. uh, my father had another church, and uh, during the Depression, he uh, felt people's economic problems were more serious than their spiritual problems, and he entered the cooperative movement, the mm -hmm. consumer cooperative movement of that time. Mm -hmm. <coughs> How did you develop an interest in sciences? I guess it was a natural thing, in part influenced by the fact that I could go to college uh, <coughs> in a college of forestry, mm -hmm. and uh, it was within commuting distance of our home. So I guess I ended up in the forestry college at Syracuse University. Right, right. And um, where did you go to graduate school then? Uh, graduate school was at, also at Syracuse. I stayed for, on for a master's and then went to for a PhD degree at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, mm -hmm. Madison, Wisconsin. And you've been to some a few other universities along the way, have you not? <laughs> yes. Well, I, uh, after after Wisconsin, I took a postdoc in Sweden. Right. And I must say. That experience transformed my life. My awareness of the world was completely altered by the opportunity to have a postdoc in Sweden. Mm -hmm. And I worked at the Royal Pharmaceutical Institute. Um, my background in graduate school was in forest or plant pathology, the diseases of trees and the microbiological deterioration of timber. Right. So I'm a, and I studied the biochemistry of the decay of timber by, uh, or wood by white rot and brown rot fungi. Mm -hmm. and, and what specifically did you work on in Sweden? Well, I pursued some further exploration of the enzyme systems of wood destroying fungi. And uh, I had the good fortune to work with another student at uh, the University of Uppsala. And uh, I think it's really true that I was not so accustomed to trying to isolate enzyme systems, but he was. So I, uh, we worked together. I brought the fungi. He brought the knowledge about how to extract the enzymes from the fluid in which we, they were growing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we characterized the, a very low molecular weight enzyme from the white rot fungus polyporous versicolor. Right. And and did they give you another diploma there in Sweden? Yes, not at that time. Uh, okay. I went back and uh, studied the nitrogen, the influence of nitrogen on the decay of wood. And, uh, and so I later com completed a series of papers. That's the way you do it in Sweden. You publish papers. And then you group a bunch of them together, and that becomes your dissertation. Uh -huh. And my uh, major professor, <laughs> he marked it my speakus. That means can be nailed. Okay. And uh, it's sort of like Martin Luther making his 95 theses in Wittenberg. <laughs> right, right. But uh, I, I thought it was marvelous that uh, he has a hammer and uh, two nails. I still have the nails. Goodness. <laughs> Goodness. And so you went to Sweden speaking Swedish? Hey, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Learn, uh, I learned Swedish on the job. Goodness. So, so, uh, and I did take some coursework, so I had a little education. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I cannot, well, I become part of Svenska om du vill, if you, I mean, I, no, sprechen Sie Deutsch. And um, we have so many Swedish families in Chautauqua County here. Right. Uh, but there are some grandparents 
grabbing a few grandkids by the collar saying, listen, mm -hmm. this guy went to Sweden not speaking Swedish, did good enough work there to acquire a graduate degree in Swedish. Yeah. <laughs> so no excuse for you not learning Swedish. No, but my defense was done in English. It was. Yeah. And uh, you had to dress up in tails. It, it was quite a, a uh, formal thing to uh, defend your dissertation in uh, Uppsala University. Mm -hmm. And you submitted multiple copies and uh, printed copies? Of yeah, there were seven papers mm -hmm. all together. Right. And, uh, they were, and I wrote a summary. And, you, and that was what was nailed to the signboard of the university. Right, right. Okay, let's switch gears. How did you find your way to Chautauqua? <laughs> I followed my wife here. Okay. And uh, Betsy uh, was a waitress at the Athenaeum Hotel. Correct. And uh, I, we met in Syracuse, and uh, in the course of uh, getting acquainted there, uh, she said, I asked what she was doing this, this summer, and she said, well, I'm going back to Chautauqua. She had been a waitress at the Athenaeum Hotel for some years, and uh, so I, I wrote her a, a letter and asked if I could come and see her. Mm -hmm. And that began our, our formal courtship. So mm -hmm. our, our courtship took place, for the most part, at uh, in Chautauqua. Did you address your letter with some formal street address or anything? Or? No. <laughs> All I said was Betsy Wright Coling. Well, it wasn't Coling then, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Betsy Wright, Chautauqua, New York. And sure enough, she got it. So you have a, an adept to the postmistress or postmaster of the day. Yeah. And you know, the postmistress at Chautauqua is a very special lady, I must say. We are privileged to have her. Very nice our, lady. Yeah, she is. I've chat, made light conversation with her, but I don't, don't really know her. And she's, they've al always taken very good care of me at that post office. Yeah. Now, how many years have you been coming to Chautauqua with that? Well, uh, I guess uh, it, that was in 1955. Okay. So, uh, 55, that's... 61. Uh, yeah, 61 years. Mm -hmm. so what are your favorite aspects of the Chautauqua experience? I expect the educational programs and the music programs. Mm -hmm. uh, Betsy was a cellist, and so we have had some interest, especially in the string section of the Chautauqua Symphony. Mm -hmm. And we support the, uh, the, what is called the festival orchestra. Well, that's uh, the young uh, aspiring performers uh, come here, right. audition for a place, mm -hmm. and uh, we've provided a scholarship for one of them. That's, from nice. That's lovely. That's lovely. Now I understand you have a particular affection for the Little Red Bridge. Yes. <laughs> you better tell me about that. <laughs> well, the Little Red Bridge has been moved. Okay. But the, the Little Red Bridge used to go across the ravine where the amphitheater is built. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I was waiting on the Aldean side okay. of, uh, of the uh, of the Little Red Bridge, and Betsy was on the other end, and uh, she had to finish her her waitress duties, and so she came running. I thought I did. Uh, I attached some significance. He was in a pretty pink <laughs> dress, <laughs> so uh, yeah. Well, she she thought she was a little late since the people she was waiting on were not. Uh, early birds getting mm -hmm. done with their dinner that night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you met her when she came. Let's switch gears for just a minute. And can you tell me about your areas of academic specialization? Talk a little bit about the research in Sweden. Well, uh, my, my study of tree diseases began at Syracuse, mm -hmm. and I worked under the Professor Bob Sobel, who uh, led me into uh, an uh, undergraduate study of tree diseases. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I stayed on with him for a master's degree and did a, a master's thesis on the, uh, the preservative tolerances of different wood-destroying fungi. Mm -hmm. That was my first uh, uh, adventure in science. Then I had a chance to, well, he recommended that I consider the University of Wisconsin for, for, a, for a PhD degree. Then mm -hmm. I went to Wisconsin, worked at the Forest Products Laboratory, which is right adjacent to uh, the campus of the University at, 
uh, in Madison. So uh, that's where I began. And then uh, after making some discoveries, uh, actually, of about how these two different kinds of fungi did their their uh, damaging work to mm -hmm. the physical structure of the wood, uh, I decided I should continue to try to find, to isolate, if possible, the enzyme systems and characterize them and see if that would give some insight into how one changed the wood in one way and the others changed the wood in quite another way. So that was the point and we published a paper on the, on the characterization of the cellulase, that's an enzyme, cellulose degrading mm -hmm. enzyme mm -hmm. of polyporous versicolor. You can find that for that fungus in many places in around Zutoka or even in North Carolina. Right. And uh, it has a, a rainbow kind of structure on the surface. That's why I call it versicolor, variable color. Right. Right. And um, then you publish these papers, and y how did you find your way from Wisconsin to North Carolina State? Well, I first, uh, I was offered a position at, uh, well, I competed for a position at, at Yale University, and John Boyce uh, was the professor there, and he'd written the definitive textbook on forest mm -hmm. tree diseases. Mm -hmm. And uh, I lost in the competition to John uh, Hunt, who was coming to New Haven from his position at the U.S. Forest Service Laboratory in 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 uh, Washington, mm -hmm. and uh, he was murdered. Oh my goodness! In a campground, and somebody tried to rob him. He protested. He got. He was murdered. So my second chance to get a, a job <laughs> as a forest pathologist, which was at Yale, uh, made, well, it's a tragic story. John Hunt was a, I, he, it was no wonder he beat me in the competition. He was more experienced and a very effective mycologist, mm -hmm. a person who studies fungi. So uh, then uh, I, I took the postdoc in Sweden and then came back to take that position. I didn't. Uh, well, it's a tragic business that, mm -hmm. and it, well, to take a, to have, to have murder in the background of your first position doesn't, well, anyway, doesn't I tried well, to do yeah. my best. <laughs> mm -hmm. And how long were you at Yale? Five years. And then you moved to? North Carolina. Okay. You know, I was the single, I was the only plant pathologist in Yale University. Mm -hmm. There was the, uh, the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station was there, and I got to know many of the people there, and right. actually published a, a series of, of publications with some of those people. But uh, my specialty requires a PhD degree, and therefore uh, it was more advantageous for me to be, and I was the single plant pathologist at Yale. I was one of 45 <coughs> plant pathologists at the same university where you studied part of your time. Indeed. And Indeed. so I went to North Carolina State, Betsy came with me, and uh, I spent 43 years as a professor before I retired. And I, ha I have to be honest with everyone, yes, my master's and doctorate are from NC State. I think I was there when you were, but on a different part of the campus. That's right. And I did make a stop at Yale, did an internship at Yale along the way. Good. And so... Um, it's a good place to be from. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> and we also know during the winter that uh, Raleigh, North Carolina is a better place than New Haven, Connecticut. Yes, it is. To be. And Chautauqua was a better place yet in the summer. <laughs> yes. In the summer. So you supervise graduate students. Let's talk a little bit about that. Right. And tell me, tell me how many graduate students, how many dissertations you supervise, and, and what, the, what the process is really like. Well, a, a, a graduate student originally chooses where he wants to study and usually is attracted by something that was done by a professor at that place. And uh, so I, I was, I took a position uh, that was occupied by a very effective, uh, one of my mentors in life, as a matter of fact, my first grant uh, that I obtained at NC State 
was with Arthur Kelman, who became the head of the Department of Plant Pathology at Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I more or less took his position, but it took two of us to do what he was doing before. So uh, then I, I stayed on with a joint appointment in the College of Forestry uh, and worked very closely with the geneticists there. They had a very fine tree improvement program run by uh, one of the most important foresters in the world. Jo uh, Bruce Zobel was his name. Mm -hmm. He was a star uh, in genetics uh, with this marvelous uh, tree improvement program. So I hitched my little red wagon to his star mm -hmm. and tried to make my way in life uh, by following in his footsteps uh, as I had uh, with Arthur Kilman before. Right. So tell me about um, this concept of indiv individualized graduate student plans and that are tailored to the student. Well, the, <coughs> the responsibility of a student is to be wise in the selection, well, the identification of what you want to do in life. And, and that involves some, f some educational preparation. Mm -hmm. So the duty of the student is to come to understand what they think their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, to identify those strengths and weaknesses, and seek uh, the guidance of a major professor, which is usually selected by the student himself or herself, and then uh, an advisory committee must be appointed to assist the major professor. And uh, so the, uh, what's necessary is for the student to have a good understanding of what they think they're good at or what they think they're not so good at. And uh, so I, I developed a listing of what I called skills and attributes essential for success in graduate school. Right. And, uh, so I would give them this checklist of intellectual skills, communication skills, personality characteristics, habits of work, mechanical skills, and I would ask the student to take this sheet and give pluses or minuses depending on what they think they're. If they're hot stuff, two pluses. Mm -hmm. If they think they really need help, two minuses, <laughs> mm -hmm. maybe only one. Or if they don't have a good understanding, just uh, leave it blank. And then the advisory committee should take this understanding, this self-understanding of the student, what they think of themselves and what they want to do with their lives. Mm -hmm. And then the duty of the major professor and the advisory committee is to help that young student grow into all the skills and attributes and that, they, that the committee believes would be helpful in the student's life. So a properly done PhD program is more than just taking some courses, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And uh, you're trying to develop a scientist. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, I think it's desirable, as was true in my case, to publish your dissertation right away, if possible even before you finished your uh, dissertation mm -hmm. and defend it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had one student who, uh, he was uh, working with Dr. Kelman, and I remember my first interview with him, his name was Don Marks, and he came in with five papers. <laughs> this is what I've done so far, what is your advice? And uh, well, that, that's getting into graduate education in a hurry. You bet. Uh, so, uh, but most students don't have aren't sure of themselves and and often they accept a suggestion of something is consistent with what they want to be, what do they want to become. And uh, and that uh, you try as the major professor or a member of the advisory committee to help him grow in or her grow in means that would ensure a reasonable good chance uh, for success in the initial phases of their life and then hopefully continue their education for the rest of their life and right. become whatever they become in the long run. Right. Now, just punctuate with this, you, you supervised how many doctoral committees then? Well, there was four PhD committees, 40. 40. And seven postdocs and the rest were master's candidates. And that's a remarkably high, remarkable high number. Well, Zobel had many more though. <laughs> but I'll, be, I'll bet you were a very 
very uh, popular person to have as, as a chairman? Well, sometimes uh, not so popular when I was giving somebody a hard time about learning how to write more effectively or mm -hmm. uh, yeah, all these skills, uh, verbal communication skills. Uh, right. Right. So let's move along. And I got two big topics I want to talk about. And the first is your uh, experience with the National Academy of Sciences. And tell me how, how you came to, to hold membership of that and what you're doing for them. Well, the National Academy has two parts. There's the honorific part. If you're good in science, you may be elected. Mm -hmm. You have to be approved for election by all the members of the Academy, which would include mm -hmm. uh, biologists and uh, uh, people who study the cosmos. Uh, I remember the first uh, article or the first uh, meeting I attended, uh, I, uh, this was my very first meeting. I was greatly surprised that I was elected, but anyway, they were, they, on the agenda of the, of, the, uh, of the annual meeting, there was a, uh, a paper on the density of neutron stars. Well, I've never heard of a neutron star, <laughs> yeah. so I thought I, I better go if that's what they do here. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, I learned the, the density of neutron stars is so great that it would take uh, a, a sturdy mountain ear much of his life to accumulate enough energy to raise him his mass, his weight. Goodness above the highest mountain on a neutron star, which might be uh, a centimeter. Goodness, goodness. So, well, anyway, your mind is stretched to new ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Oliver Wendell Holmes said, man's mind stretched to embrace a new idea never returns to its original dimension. It's, it's a remarkable statement, isn't it? Yes. I've heard a paraphrase, but I've never heard it attached to prior to our preparation for the title for Weldon Hill Holmes, and I'm happy to do it. I heard a, a former president of Chautauqua identify he was the only member of the American Academy of Sciences on Chautauqua Institution, <laughs> and, and that's remarkable. Well, I, and, I'm and not sure of that, because I haven't checked out the uh, membership yeah. list, but, right. but uh, I guess, uh, and I'm part of a science group right. here at Chautauqua, right. trying to influence the educational programs particularly to take up topics that are of interest. I mean, this whole week has been uh, devoted to the cosmos. Right. And so my mind was stretched in new dimensions to understand. Right. Now, Ellis, what projects are you currently involved in with the Academy? Well, uh, I've played a role <coughs> in one, uh, one project on the future of forestry research. Mm -hmm. That was one of my early experiences. And most recently, uh, I was inspired by uh, the contribution of one of my, the wife of one of my former students, who, uh, she was a civil engineer, she and her husband both, mm -hmm. and uh, she became director of the school system for all the students in, in upper secondary schools in Sweden. Goodness. And uh, she wrote, he was asked by the Ministry of Education to prepare a re recommendations for reform of the upper secondary schools. So anyway, uh, I thought that her paper mm -hmm. and uh, uh, would be a model for what we might consider. And so she was emphasizing the importance of vocational forms of education, apprenticeship forms of education, or what we technically call career and technical education. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have in our country uh, the idea that everyone should go to college. Well, I don't think it's desirable for everyone to go to college. Many should. Mm -hmm. And uh, her conclusion after a year-long study with a substantial co committee uh, a commission that was appointed by the Ministry of Education in Sweden, and uh, she suggested that about 45 percent should go on to college, 45 percent should choose among vocations, mm -hmm. dental hygienist, machinist, mm -hmm. uh, uh, IT specialists, mm -hmm. all sorts of jobs that do not require a four-year degree but are satisfying things. Mm -hmm. uh, we need good plumbers, auto mechanics, uh, all sorts of uh, 
of, of specialists that help with uh, our technical world. Right, right. Let me ask you one sort of final item. We discussed a paper in which you compared research in agriculture and research in medicine. Mm -hmm. And there were some wonderful findings. Could you just in a capsule tell us about that? Yeah. Well, I, I joined with the uh, man who was uh, the vice president for research at Duke University. Mm -hmm. And uh, Charles Putnam was his name. And uh, he was uh, in administrative charge of all research at Duke University, which has a fine medical school, and he was a medical doctor. So uh, uh, it, we were coming to know that the United, uh, the cost of medical care in this country was very great compared to other countries. So we joined together, and uh, of all the developed nations of the world, the United States has the highest per capita investment in health care. Goodness. And we also have the lowest per capita investment in feeding ourselves. And it's really fascinating to understand that we have 4,000 ag economists in this country that look after 9% of our gross domestic product. And we have, uh, some years ago, at the time I wrote that, paper that I gave to you, uh, uh, it was 14% of the gross domestic, but it's nearly 20% for medical, for, for medical, biomedical research is a very, and we're distinguished as a, in the world, mm -hmm. in both of these fields, right. but we've produced the lowest cost of, of food, sir, food growing and production and consumption and we have the highest of all medical costs and the lowest of all food costs in all the developed nations of the world. And yet we have a difference in the number of, of economists and the difference in the approach to funding research in each of those fields, don't we? That's right. And the method by which biomedical choices are made about what kind of research to pursue is by competitive merit review with mm -hmm. heavy emphasis on science quality. And that's very fine. And at the, in the academy, there was a great discussion about how should one ensure the highest quality of science. And competitive merit review is often regarded as the way to get. But you can have very high, have high quality science without necessarily producing something of maximum value return to the public that pays the bills for the Mm -hmm. for support of science. So uh, that's one of the things we found is that, and we would recommend that, uh, ec that medical economics, which is not taught in almost any medical school or school mm -hmm. of public health in this country, mm -hmm. but you can get a graduate degree in agricultural economics in 60 institutions Goodness. in this country. And uh, usually, Health economists are in schools of public health occasionally, mm -hmm. but more often they're in schools of life sciences. Goodness. And uh, so, anyway, th there's a big difference, and the two systems by which choices are made, formula guided, where people uh, in counties and states and the federal government make their selection of uh, uh, of what to fund, mm -hmm. and in, in biomedical research it's always top quality science that is the principle. So there's little influence for dealing with the relevancy in biomedical decision making to the critical problems in health care in this country. Goodness. We're about out of time, but one example that I would punctuate with that spoke with a physician this week about treatment of Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. And he indicated that almost no progress in the past 20 years. And I'll bet if we looked at the f degree of funding mm -hmm. and the number of people who suffer from Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. we would find something is terribly out of order. There. <laughs> and they're probably not good economists who work it through with the hard science people saying, what are the avenues of high payoff? And where should we be applying the research? Yeah, sure. And I think I think it's your 
is on a major point that is significant. Unfortunately, we're out of time. And this has been great fun, and I hope you'll come back and let's talk a bit further about issues of science. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you very much.